Brian had the unique um, privilege of actually being a very close friend of Mr. Smokey Crabtree. He spent a lot of time with Mr. Smokey and his wife, Miss Fran, at their home and really became almost a family member to them in a short period of time. He, he really um, he really knows more about Smokey than just about anybody there is today. And uh, just a little bit about Brian. Brian is a lifelong Bigfoot encrypted researcher and enthusiast. He is my research partner with Monsters, Mysteries, and Mayhem. He's also the co-host on my radio program, um, which is Monsters, Mysteries, and Mayhem also. Um, Brian is an event coordinator for the Boggy Creek Festival. He is about as knee deep in anything Bigfoot and anything cryptid that there is in the world going on today. And there's probably no one that knows more about the lore, the legend, and the mythos of, of Bigfoot and cryptozoology than any human being on earth, I think. So right now, I want everybody to, if you want to come sit down, whatever you want to do, um, but you're not going to want to miss hearing this because this is a, probably a once in a lifetime deal to get to hear all of this stuff from Brian, from somebody that actually knew Mr. Smokey and actually spent time with him. So if y'all all would just, you know, give him your attention and listen, because this is going to be worth a listen. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, Jeff. Best bud in the world. Uh, Jeff Stewart. Um, bottom line is, I'm going to show you a In Memory of Smoky Crabtree. Some of y'all know some of these things. Um, there's going to be some things you haven't heard of. But what I'm trying to do today is... Uh, you know, everybody's heard of the Patterson-Gimlin video, and everybody knows that Patterson-Gimlin, uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin are famous for the lore of, of the Bigfoot sighting in the 60s, okay? Well, that was in uh, the west part of the United States. In the middle part of the United States, Arkansas, and on down and all around, and Texas. Everybody knows Smokey Crab, too, who's interested in this subject. People who are on the peripheral know this subject. Finding Bigfoot, one of the things they said, oh, then when they went to uh, Falk, Arkansas, it's like Smoky Crabtree, the legend of Boggy Creek, it, it's all they talk about, okay? Again, I got the privilege about three years ago to meet him, and it was bigger than, <laughs> than I thought. I didn't know he was, it was such a thing. So what I'm here to talk about is a little bit about the movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek. There's no such movie if it wasn't for Smokey Crabtree or the Crabtree family. That's it. People can tell you, tell you what they want. There's no movie, therefore the influence of that movie throughout all the different people. I mean, line them up. If, if this was a crypto conference, line them up. They've been influenced by that movie in one shape or fashion or form. And that movie didn't happen without Smokey Crabtree and his family. The bottom line, what I want to talk about today is like, yay, Bigfoot and all that. This is things about Smokey Crabtree that you'll never know or never have seen before. His name was Elmo. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Uh, rumor is they, his uncle and some of the family didn't like Elmo. Well, Smokey. Where does Smokey come from? Well, I'm going to say he's, Smokey's gone. And what he told me personally and interpreting his, his son and some people that know him, his dad died when he was five years old so gosh his mother raised four girls three boys by herself and he was five and most of the kids were very young okay he tended to get the pipe and some tobacco for dad and and therefore there might have been a little influence of Smokey because he was the one getting his pipe all the time his dad that is in reference to the gigantic gar that he used to get down there and uh, you say Boggy Creek but it's the Sulphur River Bottoms because if you've been down there Boggy Creek can be kind of big but it, you know sometimes you can't even get a boat in it it's a real creek it feeds into the Sulphur River and the Sulphur River Bottoms is a swamp area that's what we're really talking about um, so again uh, you know I'll go back to this he was a boxer he was in the Merchant Marines in California stationed in California 
He was an amateur Golden Gloves champion over there while he was in the Merchant Marines. Are you kidding me? Uh, this is him with Daryl, Larry. It, it's going to reference a few times to where uh, somebody's sitting. Again, that's him and his promoter. He did, he's done so many things, and there's so many things I would love to tell you, but he's done so many things. He was 88 when he died, but it wasn't like he was a boxer forever. He was a Golden Gloves champion over there, but he was a master welder as a trade. He was in the Union down in South Arkansas of almost 60 years. Um, look at uh, Saudi Arabia, okay? That's not just words, that's real. He worked in 18 countries and almost every state in the Union welding. This is him in front of a welder supply store, it says 1958, in Falk, Arkansas, okay? Later you'll see a grocery store he started in Falk, Arkansas. He has done so many things. It is just uh, amazing. This is, uh, okay, when I say he's had contracts and various things throughout the nation, the world, he's, guess what he's done? He's hunted there too. You could just about say he's hunted in about every state in the Union. A lot of times, that's one of his earlier houses, and there's, I don't know if you can see, but there might be a lake back there, the uh, Crabtree Lake, <laughs> okay? And there's a story about that one too, how uh, he actually, with a bulldozer, dug that lake. It was acres and acres. It took him forever. Uh, and again, I might read some of these stories later, but uh, and they may be reiterated, but bottom line is these Corps of Engineers or whatever came down from Little Rock, uh, you can't do it. You're, you're going to flood the area. You're going to flood a house. I mean, you can't do it. And, and gee whiz, I'm going to tell you one quick thing. This is not the Alaskan pipeline. But I'll give you a little reference to this. Master Welder, all these different things. He hit the first rivet on the Alaskan pipeline. He had a contract. He was one of the first people they called whenever they were creating the Alaska pipeline. He hit the first rivet. He has, this is him on the Sulphur River. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth. You can see this is him. I mean, you can see some pictures, but most of the ones of him on the river is him smiling. Him out there doing his thing, smiling. And look at the, look at the gun. Okay. He didn't go too many places by his gun or... He's a hunting fella. I'm going to just tell you that. <laughs> okay. And he had some fun on the river. <laughs> I don't really know who that is, but they had some fun on the river. And, and again, I, what I mean by river is the Sulphur River because uh, Boggy Creek is just a tributary, but it's where the sightings of the thing happen mainly. Uh, and look at the size of, that's his lake, that's the Crabtree Lake, but look at the size of that Cadillac. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's not a Cadillac. Is that a Cadillac? Yeah, that's a Cadillac. Okay, this is his first book. Uh, that's a, a, a kind of a poster board outside of, gosh, he's had so many houses down there in Falk. This is one of the festivals back in the day. So a lot of, if you've read the books or not, but, but the bottom line is a lot of this is just him being an outdoorsman. There's some things that I've wrote that, I'm, I'm, again, I might reiterate. He was so poor he hunted and camped down with his two brothers down in the Sulphur River bottoms for weeks at a time. This is, this is going to be one of those very truthful things, I'm going to tell you. Him and his brothers, because they were so poor, took their clothes off for weeks at a time, hung them up in the tree. It was running around hunting and fishing and surviving and having a great time. So why, that's why his sisters didn't hang out with him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say that. But bottom line is, that's how poor that fellow was. A lot of his food was from the, from the hunting and fishing right out of the Sulphur River. Uh, for plates, you know, you got old five-gallon jugs you can buy at Lowe's or whatever. You know those little tops? That's what they, that's their plates. <laughs> they had one plate 
every night somebody else passed it around and got to have the plate. Otherwise, you're, sit, you're eating on the bottom of a top of a five-gallon bucket. And by the way, that's my son. He's, he befriended me. That was about two and a half, three years ago. My parents went to meeting. Uh, very welcoming. That's Chester Moore and his dad. I can't tell you how many people... I mean, there's a, there's a whole other side of things and rumors or whatever, but I, from what I've seen, I can't tell you how many people call him a father figure. Chester Moore was one of them. Robert Robinson was one of them. Uh, that's his son, Jay. Uh, that's the store he started in Falk. And Ruth, you know which one it is. It was the one to the right. It's kind of like a religious place now. That's the one. Um, and as best he could, and he had to go out of business, but as best he could for the area of Falk, he kept his prices low enough to where he could survive. But that way, that's his whole family, by the way. I think that's his mom, his four sisters, and his two brothers right there. That's Smokey right there to the right. Uh, but anyway, he kept prices as low as he could. <laughs> that's Joe Kent. If anybody, has, That's an Elvis impersonator, by the way. And you'll see another picture of him. Uh, a little bit of a story on him. Gosh, maybe I could stop it. That's Larry Parks. <laughs> okay. I know some of those guys know him. Uh, he's part of the group Tex Texas Re Louisiana Research Organization. Um, Joe Kent, there's a story about Joe Kent. They were doing a fundraiser down in Falk. Again, this is things I would love to tell you that have nothing to do with Bigfoot, even though he's the legendary Bigfoot guy. Okay. Joe Kent was a um, Elvis impersonator. They were going to have a, a show at the Falk High School. Well, to raise money. Joe Kent, the only reason he even came down was because he wanted to meet Smokey. So he had a couple concerts he was going to do. And uh, so the coordinators and all that were, okay, Joe Kent's coming. He went out for about four days camping and hunting with, and that was part of the pictures, with Smokey. And the coordinators finally, the day of the concert, was like, Smokey, oh my God. I mean, we've been trying to reach Joe Kent for four days. Where in the world do you know anything about him? He's like, oh yeah, he's right here with me. We're hunting out in the bottoms. And they're like, well, can he please still do the concert? Yeah, he's coming. <laughs> I mean, but people, and Joe Kent, I guess at the time was North Texas. There's a lot of people who want to be around Smokey um, and that's a group session down at Alex Smith Park that's a, a conference at uh, South Texas I think in Orange Texas look at the crowds he drew uh, he's been to the Ohio Bigfoot conference that's in his uh, little museum in Falk I mean uh, towards the end Smokey Crabtree was at a um, uh, nursing home. If I was to communicate any of those things out, and I was pretty much in contact pretty close with Miss Fran, his wife at the time, at the end, anytime I would have commented about anything, everybody on the world would have like, oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? So I didn't. But whenever it happened and he passed, obviously I went ahead and told everybody. But here's what happened. Um, Fran Crabtree, it happened on Saturday night. She called me on Sunday morning of the 17th of January. I looked at my phone. I saw Fran Crabtree. I was like, this ain't going to be good. So I went in the back room and I took the call and it was, here's what she said. Smokey is gone. And this guy called me because I, I posted. This guy called me. I'm sorry, I know spoke you pretty good. Okay, he called me Sunday afternoon. I'm like, how in the world you got my phone number? Uh, and, and, and Daniel's like, well, I got my ways. I'm a journalist. I'm like, okay, but I, I don't really know you. And so I asked him a few questions and realized who it was. And I was like, okay. So he interviewed me for this and various other people. California, boom, okay. Uh... Another blog, um, this is how, uh, 
I don't know which one's which, but Lyle Blackburn, I know y'all have heard of him. He, he blogged about it. You know, uh, Lauren Coleman's one of these. Robert Robinson's one of them. And there is endless ones. Endless people blogged about it, and everybody was celebrating him. It, you know, uh, it was really cool to see these people coming out, supporting the fact that what he meant to everybody. And, and that's what I'm trying to do is give it a little bit more rather than just about, let me, let me read a few things. So, and this is things that either he told me or I've interpreted from his books, but a lot of it he told me. Smokey was a larger than life individual. He has brought to life the meaning of don't say it if you don't mean it. He has many stories in his books where he's relayed that very concept. He has personally discussed some of these with me too. The thing that I would express to anyone who knew the legend is he is much more than that. Some of the things him and his brothers did whenever he was uh, young would be he had a way, you know how there's those noodling shows where they go get those catfish and whatever? Well, he did this. If he was 88, he did it when he was eight, 10 years old. So almost 80 years ago, he was noodling catfish in the Sulphur River, making money. People from Falk and Texarkana would go down there and they'd say, we're having a fish fry. And they'd go out there. I guess they put their clothes on. I don't know how that would work. <laughs> but they would go out there and noodle, get some fish. And these guys would give them quarters. Then they would turn around because they're camping, get shotgun shells. They couldn't afford the whole box. They had to deal with a guy in Falk or wherever to get a partial box so they can get a couple shotgun shells. So they were really good at shooting. <laughs> they didn't miss. So if they had a, one bullet and one shotgun shell, and guess what happened? They got a squirrel or they got a rabbit or whatever they got. That's what they got. They didn't miss. Um, there's actually a story, I don't even know if it's in here, about how he would explain to me how good a shot his sisters were. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, one time I was out hunting. His sister and a guy that kind of liked her was out there. They were hunting. So he was trying to be like, hey, I'm hunting and with the Crabtree sister. Right in front of Smokey, here's what happened. There goes a rabbit. Their dog's chasing a rabbit. And the, and the, the guy's like, uh, well, heck, we, we need to shoot it. And uh, so his sister had a gun. Pow! And the, and the rabbit fell. And it's like, and the guy who was trying to impress the sister, uh, I don't even see the bullet hole. Went and picked the rabbit up and still brought it over there. Where's the bullet? And uh, again, country folk, she's like, well, don't you see? I shot it right in the eye. She shot the eye. Bow, shot the eye out. And, and Smokey's like, yeah? And the, and the guy was like, uh, okay. It, it, you know, I don't know how that worked out for him. But let me just say, he was quite impressed and probably intimidated. Uh, because to say the least, that Crabtree family didn't play. Did not play. Um... That's his son, Jay. Don't know. <laughs> okay, this is at one of the conferences not too, too long ago. Again, he's been invited all over the United States to conferences and various things. Okay, I took that picture at the last Boggy Creek Festival. That's Lyle Blackburn and, and Smokey. Now, I'm going to say this. Notice his face. Yeah, he's kind of happy. Okay. That's his son, Jay. That's his last son, his, uh, Smokey Crabtree Jr. They call him Jay. That's Abe Del Rio. Some of the people, uh, Michael Hall and some of them fellas, they know Abe Del Rio is from Minnesota. He's actually lost a lot of weight since then. But a lot of people, okay, Minnesota, a lot of people come to visit Smokey. If they ever go down to South Texas, they're coming through Falk. If they know, well, at least they did now that he's passed. But, okay, if you can see that name, Hayden Brooks, this little fella has a, a disease and... He's a Bigfoot enthusiast, okay? 
uh, some people that I know in Ohio, kind of with the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, uh, and by the way, Walter Tippy knows them very well and asked me to go there and, and get his first book and get him autographed to Hayden and all that. Okay, well, I made a little thing. Oh, he autographed that little thing. That, that little kid is so excited. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm a collector. I, I, uh, we're going to auction these off, by the way. But I don't want this messed up necessarily. He carried that book around for months on end to the point where his mom said it was kind of ragged. It's like it was his favorite book. But uh, that's that picture of that. And Smokey, uh, you saw the picture earlier about the scouts. He had people on his land all the time scouting, uh, camping out and all. Didn't charge them and whatever. He's a big guy in the community. Okay, if y'all don't know, there's Miss Ruth right there. There's me, Smokey. Now, here's what I'm referencing the face. <sighs> he was excited to be there. For about three years, I've, it got to the point where I bought his books and this and that, and he sells jelly. When I came over, if he was having a good day, he would invite me into his house, and we'd talk and whatever. He'd just tell some stories. Okay, for three years, I said, man, there's a lot of people love you. A lot of people want to see you. Please come to the Boggy Creek Festival. And for three years, he came that first one. There's, they've had many renditions. But the latest one was um, this past year. And uh, so about three years ago, they had one again. He didn't go to that second one. He wasn't feeling good or the love. And for three years, I was basically at his house. Come on, you got to go, you got to go. I knew he was coming there, okay? <clears throat> there was about, let me just say hundreds of people in a room about this size, right, Miss Ruth? <laughs> there was hundreds of people and vendors and various things. And when he hit the door, I knew he was coming. You could have heard a pin drop because everybody's like, they're smoky. <laughs> and okay. There was people like taking pictures. It was just like, oh my God, they're smoking. Okay, here's me. I'm not, I knew him for three years. I know people have known him for lots longer. But the bottom line is, we he befriended me, and he was having a great time with me and Miss Ruth or whatever. Uh, he was having a great time overall. But you see the difference in his face. We were having a really good time, me and him, okay? And here's another bottom line. I wanted to share that with my buddy, Ruth. That's why the picture's like that. That's why it wasn't just me and Smokey. That's why it was me and you, okay? That is, a, he's got a story about, that's a real otter, but it's stuffed, how it attacked him in the boat. I mean, it's when one of his books, he somehow he turned around and he was able to shoot it. It was coming after him. He came right out of the water. Um, all right. We're going to go to th a few more slides, and then I'm going to say a few more things. Again, this, again, it's, you know, these pictures are all about family. People really like and to be around him, you know, getting their kids to meet him, nephews, sons, that's, I mean, that's a little bit towards the end, but <clears throat> that last picture with me and Ruth and him was in October. He went downhill from there, but I actually took that picture. That was a, from Walter Tippy, a, a, a smoke, a Boggy Creek knife. That's a, that's a big knife. His 88th birthday, that down in Falk. Crypto Steward of the Year, Texas Bigfoot Research Center. I mean, he was always, if you go in his little uh, museum out there, he's got plaques and things, and he's a welder. And, and this is, again, towards the end a little bit. Uh, the brothers has died. I mean, I think that's his mom died. I think that's a couple sisters and stuff. That was all that was left. Um, 
There's a few more pictures of, of uh, Lauren Coleman and him. And Robert Robinson. Anyway, at the, at the end of the festival, him and uh, I got him and this guy dressed up like, uh, you remember the guy dressed up down there? His name was Billy McDonald. He dressed up like the foul monster. Um, so I got him to take a picture of that, and that was the last picture uh, he took. So again, just a few quick facts. Uh, His uh, second book, he told me a story about it. And it's called Too Close to the Mirror. This one's got him on it. This one's got a bunch of people on it. And him, smaller. And I asked him, what does that mean? It's kind of in his book, but he gave me a little bit more explanation. <clears throat> Bottom line is, what do you see when you get close to the mirror? You see your own reflection. Okay. And this is something, you know, a version of it. You can take and understand what I'm saying and live it. Well, he's like, don't get close to, too close to the mirror. Meaning, back up from the mirror. What do you see when you back up from the mirror? Well, like that picture references, you see a, probably a lot of people that supported you in their life, in your life. Okay? So that way you're not full of yourself and arrogant. And, Ooh, my life is all about me. You back up from the mirror, you relax, contemplate some of you know some of these guys that really you know uh, say that take time. You back up from the mirror and we'll look at the people who supported you and don't forget them. So don't stand too close to the mirror of life. Okay. Um, I was a pallbearer at his at his uh, funeral. It was a very small funeral. Uh, Lyle Blackburn was there, uh, Craig Wool Eater, a couple other people. Uh, we were invited to be pallbearers. And here's my thoughts on the funeral proceedings on January 23rd. Frank McFerrin, a longtime foul guy, gave an inspiring down to earth speech at the funeral and graveside about growing up in the Falk area and how Smokey was a man of many talents of which no one can say he didn't succeed if he set his mind to it. Most of the talk of memories had nothing to do with the legend or the legend of the man. It was explained to us that Smokey was truly a man to be admired for his salt of the earth qualities and his ability to teach, accommodate, and ultimately live off the land in every way that the Sulphur River Bottoms provided. Smokey was also described as a master storyteller. We were given a few stories to smile about. I was deeply honored to have been asked to be a pallbearer. His legend will live forever in the hearts and minds of the Bigfoot community and to everyone he has ever met in his long traveled life. Rest in peace, Smokey. I will personally never get too close to the mirror. So thank you, and that's, that's all I've got today. And I swear to you, I could talk to you for hours about the things he's talked to me about. And we are actually... I'm going to give these to the auction. A whole set of his books. They are not signed, but they are in perfect condition of the books he's written. And here's the bottom line. 99% of this is hunting techniques. It's him growing up. It's his family and how uh, his family was known and his mom taught them how to, out of certain mud down in the Falk area in the Sulphur River Bottoms, they created chimneys and built houses with it. It's only certain mud down there. I, I don't know what the deal is, but uh, and only his family and some of those people he taught knew that certain mud. So he went around the area to various little uh, rodeos and things and the scouts and taught the scouts and some of those kids how to create these things. So there's, a, there's some houses down there that the chimney's still standing. Maybe the house ain't, but <laughs> you know how that you see it in the woods because of that mud that the Crabtree family made. And uh, there's so many more things, but uh, that's all I've got. And, and uh, you know, uh, like, like Jeff said, we're on Monsters, Mysteries, and Mayhem, uh, various ways. You can friend me on Facebook. I could tell you all kinds of stories about Smoky Crabtree. So uh, that's all I've got. Thank y'all very much. Okay, thanks.
Hi.